It's Friday, May 25th. Let's talk PlayStation. All right, a lot of news stories to discuss from this past week. Uh, a lot of juicy stuff, a lot of big news stories because Sony recently had an investor meeting. A lot of great things always come out of that. So as always, we'll do some smaller news stories working up to the big stuff. Um, so we'll get right into this one that's actually kind of really f funny and somewhat ironic. But um, So basically, uh, a recent PSN user claimed that they were banned because they had a message exchange um, from playing a game on Fortnite and... In the message exchange, this person apparently threatened the other user by saying, Oh, hey, my dad works at Sony. I'll get you banned. And apparently that's punishable by PSN Terms of Service. So actually, when you agree to the PlayStation Network um, EULA, it says specifically in there that you can't imitate or pretend to affiliate with somebody that works at Sony, and you can't use that in a very threatening manner against another you know, another person. Um, which, yeah, that voids that. That totally is... a. Uh, punishable by uh, by the service's uh, terms, and the person was straight up banned, which seems, and I mean, if we're actually talking about the ethics of this, I would say that seems pretty excessive to me, because, like, that seems like such a throwaway thing, like, that's the quintessential online argument, um, especially with, like, a younger audience, maybe somebody that's, I don't know, you know, 15, younger than 15, 10, 12, I mean, you know, that's just something that, like, kids do, you know, and I, that would kind of really be bogus if, like, somebody was banned immediately for that, but... Um, possibly this person is, uh, also leaving out the details that this was, like, uh, you know, their third or fourth punishable offense or something, and it led up to a, uh, a ban or something, but, I don't know. I mean, if we're, if we're gonna really get in the minutia of that, then... I guess that's an entirely different conversation to have. But while we're on the topic of PSN, we'll go into something that was revealed from the investor meeting, which is that PSN monthly active users. Sony revealed that it is currently at 80 million monthly active users for PSN. That's a lot. That's active users, not just um, signups for the service, because there's actually way more than that. Um, but 80 million active is a, is, is a pretty large amount of people. And those amount of people equate to 800 million hours of gameplay per week. So that's nuts. Uh, that's an, a, a, a ridiculous amount of time, and I couldn't really equate it to anything right now off the top of my head, but there's some semi-cool but also useless information for you to digest. While we're on the topic of useless cool information to digest, Sony also revealed that the black DualShock 4 controller is the most profitable controller ever. And that is the most oddly specific thing I think they've ever mentioned, but... Um, yeah, it didn't sell the most units, it's not the most sold controller ever, but if we're talking about how much money the controller has made, specifically the Black DualShock 4 is currently number one. That which makes me think, okay, well then, how far off is it from being, like, number one in terms of units sold? I mean, because, like, honestly, DualShock 4s are, like, kind of ridiculously expensive, especially some of the fancy colored ones, like, um, the, uh, the fancy blue one that I got, um, the crystal blue, whatever they called this thing, um, I just had to get it because it's, like, it's such a nostalgia trip from, like, those, uh, clear blue DualShock 2s, but that was, like, $65, but the, but also the black ones, like, I always see them go on sale for, like, $45, it may be even lower, so I don't, man, I don't know how that got to number one. Either way, this is ridiculous to even talk about, but that's another thing that Sony said. And while we're on the topic of sales and success, yes, I am killing it with the segues recently, God of War, the recently, uh, the recently released God of War, it is now crowned as the most successful PlayStation exclusive launch. So, if we're talking games like Last of Us, Uncharted 4, um, Horizon Zero Dawn recently, God of War is the number one biggest PlayStation exclusive launch ever. Um, which is great. So uh, I'm sure the team at Sony Santa Monica are pleased with that for sure. I mean, Corey Barlog, I remember being the game's director, was very moved and and uh, just got very emotional about all the reviews and the the a lot of what people have been saying about the game because the game actually did turn out to be fantastic. And of course, it was kind of a risk for Sony at the time because they dramatically changed the game from what God of War used to be. So uh, yeah, and I always like to mention it because. A lot of the developers that make the games that we uh, play and enjoy so much work 80 to 100 hour work weeks, so I'm sure everybody there is um, is uh, absolutely thrilled with this news. So going back to the uh, investor meeting, uh, Sony Interactive Entertainment President and CEO John Codera actually responded to a magazine or a uh, recent interview uh, about, they, they, he was basically questioned about if Sony was going to do a PlayStation Mini uh, in regards to what Nintendo has done recently with the uh, NES and the Super NES, making a smaller you know, little form factor box with, you know, loaded up with 30 some odd games, some of the best games on the platform, and then sell to the consumers for, you know, around 100 bucks or something like that. Will Sony do something like that? John was quoted as saying in response to this, There's nothing I can talk about at this time. Our company is always digging up past assets, and I think there are various ways to do it. There have been discussions happening in the company on what kind of ways are there. I mean, I will say personally, I don't, 
I don't see Sony doing doing something like this. I mean, don't get me wrong, I would absolutely love if they made a little small PlayStation and, and loaded up with the best that the original PlayStation had. Um, and make enough of them, because Lord knows they will sell like hotcakes, probably. But I don't know, it just doesn't seem like a Sony move to me. And I say this acknowledging the fact that in recent years, Sony's been very nostalgic and and just throwing like PlayStation cameos left and right. I mean, if you remember like back in 2013, before the PS4 was being released, and they did that um, hashtag PlayStation Memories video, that video was so cool, right? And then they did prior videos of generations of PlayStations and, and showing off like you know, like, the evolution of each console, and then all their, like, tweets and stuff like that, you know, they've definitely been, been very nostalgic heavy, but I just, I don't know, I just don't see them doing something like this. It would be dope, for sure, but I don't know, I don't see it, but if they do have something like that planned in the pipeline, then only time will tell, but for me, it seems like John's kind of referring to, like, what they've been doing with, like, uh, PS1 Classics or the premium PS2 games on the PlayStation Store, you know, up them, giving them trophies, uh, maybe they're gonna do more stuff like that, I mean, now there's, those PS2 games are on PlayStation Now, so, uh, I'm thinking maybe that's what he's referring to. So another thing out of the investor meeting was about how PlayStation VR is listed under the improvement section uh, when talking to investors. Uh, basically, Sony said that it's below expectations in terms of the growth, the growth for the market. Although they did say PlayStation VR is growing, the actual market of where virtual reality is right now is below expectations, which is unfortunate. I mean, I know a lot of people always get stir crazy about VR and they go, oh my God, it's a gimmick. I hate it. I don't like it. And these are always the people that have never tried it. If you've never tried it, you're, I'm sorry, but you're just flat out wrong. You just can't really have an opinion about it because VR is totally awesome. I've never, I've never met a single person that tried it and they didn't, um, they didn't thoroughly enjoy it or, or like it or think it was cool or thought it had potential. Um, mini rant over because I know there's always those people that just say VR is stupid. The problem with VR is that it's just such a barrier of entry for a lot of people. And Sony is actually the market leader right now with PlayStation VR because it is uh, a premium headset that is the lowest point of entry to get into. Um, which is great for people, but at the same time, it's still kind of a, a steep amount of money to ask for people to, to jump into. It's just not something people typically do with like, you know, 200 some odd dollars on top of already having a PlayStation on top of having to buy a PlayStation 4 But that's what makes it a little bit more accessible is that a lot of people already have ps4s um, And even more so um, The one thing that I had talked about a long time ago, which is that I was more worried about the sustainability of it in terms of de developers because uh, for the amount of people that have PlayStation VR and then for the amount of de developers that have to focus on that small little subset of people that have PlayStation VR and if it, and if they can make a bigger or like as bigger as the budget gets bigger for a game that is on PlayStation VR like a full scale Resident Evil 7 for example I mean it's great that R RE7 could be played without VR but picture a game with picture a game on the scale of RE7 that can only be played in VR. That sounds awesome, but the budget for that is so damn high, and they're probably not going to sell enough to make to offset the costs and, and make a profit. That's what scares me more, not, more than anything. I'm sure that plays a major key role in why VR isn't um, growing at the expectation that it is. Um, but at the same time, Sony is a business, and they have their own expectations of these things, and, and more often than not, a lot of the times they don't meet those expectations. Um, and it is even it's it's more telling about what they'll want to do in the far future and, and we'll be talking about that in a second in regards to the next generation because this is something that sony did halfway into the playstation 4's life cycle and it very much feels like a first generation device but moving into playstation 5 will sony have a headset ready day and date with playstation 5 or will they have it ready a few months after or will it be something that they would offer bundled into the system will they have an sdk baked into um the ps5 dev kits that will help developers get mechanics built into the, like uh into into games you know what i what you know what i mean sony's doubled down on it pretty hardcore but i think the real question is how serious are they going to be with it um in the next generation all right time to talk about the playstation vita um john codera again uh sie president and ceo finally gave us a little bit of a deadline on playstation vita which is great because we just talked about it last week in terms of like where vita is possibly going to be and how long does it possibly have well sony well john himself kind of put a bit of a timeline on it and basically said 2020 is probably when they'll finish up with playstation vita um he was actually quoted as saying while sales shipments of ps vita for europe and america are over we're still continuing sales for asia and japan but in the end we're on a direction to wrap it up within 
two years, 2020. Now, unlike Andrew House, if you remember, Andrew House was pretty vocal about the fact that he just doesn't think the market conditions were there for PlayStation Vita and for portable gaming. But John actually seems a little bit more forward and a little bit more, um, a little bit more optimistic about it. He was also quoted as saying, "In what ways we can make more unique experiences by having customers use the portable device already sitting in their hands? We're currently having various considerations with such point of view." Now, what we can take away from this is right away. I mean, John was upfront about it, right? No Europe, no North America. That's Dunzo, right? We're working on uh, just. Uh, Asian territories that's why uh, Vita cartridges are still being manufactured there and that's all well and good so I mean I mean we got I think we got way longer out of it than we really did uh, again it like lived a full life cycle granted it did not sell well at all it actually made it to a full life cycle um, and if you're accounting for two plus years in Japan, that's actually a much longer life cycle than, than you would typically uh, see. So I don't know. I mean, do do what you will with that information. But at least at least we have somewhat of a timeline for like the straight up nail in the coffin, like no more manufacturing of Vita developers are not making games. It's over. That will probably be in 2020. Now, how about PS4? Yes, we're finally getting into that new story. John Codera recently said from the investor meeting that PS4 is entering the final, uh, the end phase of its life cycle. So this is uh, this was picked up a lot and talked a lot online because a lot of people were getting worried, like, oh my god, PS4 is over. All right, let's get a few things out of the way immediately, all right? The end phase of the console life cycle. He also actually gave a bit of a timeline on that and said for sure support would go at least until 2021. He also said that you can actually still expect more PS4 exclusives from Sony's first party studios. Um, and, well, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, clearly there's a few more, few years left. PS5 is not going to be announced. I don't think PS5 is going to be announced this year. Like, I, people need to get that out of their head right now. We still have major PlayStation 4 games that have not be, been released yet. Um, and as I had kind of thought um, a few episodes prior, which is that, yeah, I think a vast majority of Sony's worldwide studios are probably going to start working on PS5 games once they, once they wrap up their current titles. But I'd have to figure maybe one or two developers, maybe, I don't want to say held back certainly, but they will probably still release uh, maybe one or one last PlayStation 4 exclusive. Or they could just release a multi-platform game, you know what I mean? So they could possibly, because that's the thing about this overlap from PS4 to PS5, which we'll get into in a second here, which is that Sony is still going to be using x86, you know what I mean? They're still, I mean, they purposely built this thing. They knew for a fact going with x86 that they wanted to future-proof this thing. Um, and so doing a cross-platform title for one of Sony's first-party studios may not be out of the realms of impossibility. This is probably certainly on the cards, and that's probably what John's referring to as they look at this long roadmap, because Sony does have this long roadmap. They do look at those things, and they do know for a fact that they probably want to do one or two of those things. And there may be some overlap here. When he says 2021, that's not necessarily saying that... You know, PlayStation 5 is going to come out in 2021. This would imply that maybe PlayStation 5 would come out in 2020, which I think a lot of people are in agreement now that that's kind of what Sony's probably gunning for. A lot of people are probably thinking, okay, 2020 is when we're going to get a PlayStation 5. Um, and that's full on, you know, maybe announcement 2019, but actual launch for sure in 2020. Um, but the overlap there would be that, okay, Sony would keep supporting PS4 up until to, uh, 2021, which you would also think that seems kind of short. Um, and I would... But, you know, a few years ago, I probably would have agreed with you, but if there's one thing we learned from the PS3 to the PS4 and 360 to Xbox One is that um, consumer adaptation was actually much more rapid this time around. Whereas from PS2 to PS3, <clears throat> a lot of people held on to their PS2s. A lot of people still played PlayStation 2, but as we move on to internet-connected devices, as we live in a world where we upgrade our smartphones once a year... Um, uh, more and more people, uh, you know, are upgrading their PC parts and things like that. People do enjoy having the latest and greatest. So it just seems like that's a thing where a year overlap actually seems pretty reasonable. It seems like a lot of people will probably, um, upgrade, you know, well, at, and that's not to say also to that Sony's entirely ceasing PS4 support at 2021. That's just them implying, okay, we're not going to make any more PS4 games. You know what I mean? Sony's entire worldwide studios would move on to PlayStation 5 development. Sony would more than likely still manufacture PS4s well beyond 2021. They would absolutely still support PlayStation Store and PlayStation Network well beyond 2021. I mean, if anything, PS3 is still more than likely going to have um, PSN and PS Store support into 2020. Probably a little bit further than that. I would I would have to guess. Um, 
it's just again it's that it's that overlap and everything but people are if anybody's worried about that then you you know don't have to be too hyperbolic about it now moving on to our final news story and yes it's the juicy playstation 5 stuff that i know you all want to hear about um and the cards are pretty much right on the table right this is totally open book so basically what was confirmed for sure this past week is that sony is actually working closely with amd on uh, amd's new ryzen core which is uh, a new set of cpu technology that will be due for around 2020. Why would Sony be have a Why would Sony have a vested interest in working with AMD? Well, currently, uh, a highly customized AMD Jaguar is what powers the PlayStation 4. So yes, that's why Sony works with AMD. But why are they working with AMD currently on new technology, the new Ryzen Core? All right, you know we don't we don't even have to explain that to you. But another interesting thing about it is that um, within Sony's um, recent um, goals for uh, their investor meeting, one specific thing that is actually mentioned is how they want to mitigate. Um, the, the, the problem of uh, console life cycles. Now, how do you mitigate console life cycles? Well, you offer backwards compatibility. And this was something we've talked about a thou. Now, how do you mitigate console life cycles? Well, you offer backwards compatibility. This is something Sony knew they were doing immediately from the start with PlayStation 4. You know, we've only talked about it 10 million times probably, and I know a lot of you guys hate when I say we've talked about this before, but gosh darn it, we have. Because Sony uses an, Sony purposely chose the x86 for a specific reason. Not only is it easy to work with, it's easier for developers, uh, but this is a very long-term thing that they had specifically chosen, and they learned from the PS3's uh, complicated cell processor and really boned them moving forward, and that's why... To this day, they probably still will not offer hardware backwards compatibility with PlayStation 4, for example, with PlayStation 3 games. More than likely because it's not even worth it in any way, shape, or form, or even remotely possible because it would be too demanding on PlayStation 4 hardware. Now, possibly further down the road, maybe it would be in the cards with some, you know, more advanced technology. Um, but even then, that's a, ma that's a matter of, at that point, emulating... And emulating is an entirely separate beast uh, in itself. We know Sony's very finicky with emulation because, while well, they want it to be on their terms. There's a whole QA process they have to go through. It's very expensive. There's a lot of resources that has to go into QAing and um, making sure that every single specific emulated game runs pro uh, runs proper uh, runs properly. Excuse me. But if we're going in a situation where PS4 games can natively play just fine without any major issues on PlayStation 5, which will likely be the case if PlayStation 5 is being powered with the latest AMD technology that is uh, a highly customized CPU, but it's also basically x86 and the most general, uh, and, the, and the most general non-tech way to explain it. Um, everything is lining up perfectly. Uh, this seems like absolutely what Sony will, is more than likely this is why they're working closer with AMD. Now, of course, nothing is set, nothing's confirmed. Um, you know, this is all speculation at this point. But what we do, what we do know for a fact is that Sony's working closely with AMD, and they are working with uh, technology that is not prime time ready yet, up until possibly around 20, uh, 2020, 2021, for at least the first generation of this Ryzen Core technology. Um, so, you know, the, again, it's the vested interest thing. Why would Sony be working on something like this when it's not even, this technology in, is not in any way powering any PlayStation products because, well, it probably will in the future. Anyway, those are some of the news stories that I want to talk about with you guys this past week. Okay, so I knew, I knew for a fact this video was not, like, nobody was going to watch it. But I still loved it anyway. So basically, if you've played the Katamari Damase games, you know that they have really weird writing in it. And um, one thing I, for some reason, subjected myself to is I went through the game's collection menus, which if you've collected every single item in the Katamari games, there's a lot. You can pretty much pick up everything from a little thumbtack to a large piece of land. There's Somebody was responsible for writing a description of every single item in the game. So what I did was I went through every single item in the game and I found out, I, I basically recorded some of the funniest ones and I put it in a little 10 minute video. Definitely, I'm telling you, you will laugh if you watch it. There's some really, really weird things written in the Katamari dossier for the vast amount of items that you can find in that game. Anyway, um, I don't know what video you can expect coming up this Monday or Tuesday. I'll probably, if I'm only going to be doing one video a week from now on, I'll probably start releasing them Tuesdays. Just an FYI, so don't expect the whole Monday Wednesday thing, because again, it just got a little too much for me making all those videos. But I guarantee we're still doing new new videos. And again, within a week or two, I will finally have a more long form video ready. This video will probably be around 30, 45 minutes. It's the most work I've really done in a long time for a video, and I need you guys to check this one out and um, give me some feedback on it for sure. And I. 
I'm fairly confident that a lot of you guys will definitely dig it. But that's all I can say for now, just to keep you guys, um, I don't know, just to sort of uh, titillate your fancy, you know what I mean? Okay. Little inappropriate, I know, but let's face it, that's pretty much what I do during these last few moments of Let's Talk PlayStation. I talk personally to you guys, and I get a little weird sometimes, you know? I can't help it, because uh, I just feel so comfortable around you. Anyway, that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you guys next Friday.